WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Welcome to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Spiegel, LWRN.net. You can call in and join me and my guest here tonight at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. I'm going to be joined today by the Reverend Richard Blaney with the lead pastor at the Benevolence Church, um, has a doctorate in ministry, Liberty University, um, the uh, Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, he has a Master of Arts in Theology, St. Mary's Seminary, Seminary and the University Master of Divinity, uh, Liberty Baptist Seminary and a Graduate School. Also has written a book on marriage as a spiritual discipline. And so we're very lucky and uh, privileged here to have the Reverend Richard Laney with us today. Hello, Hello Reverend. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing well, and I want to make sure. How do I pronounce your name, last name properly, sir? Uh, you were doing it fine, Laney. Oh, okay, I, I didn't know if it was Laney or Laney, and I want to make sure I got it right. So, Laney. Um, Reverend, I uh, appreciate your being with us today, and um, you have a really outstanding theological background here. Um, one of the, uh, I guess, the Got a lot of questions going on out there today in the political world with regards to uh, our deviating from uh, the theological basis that the country's founded upon, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to talk to us about a couple of those here today. Well, thank you for having me on. Um, I did a lot of uh, study for uh, on the subject of marriage. My uh, doctoral thesis was on marriage, and so I... I looked at all the available sources, including the legal basis for it, because, of course, there is a natural definition for marriage, which is the pair bond between a man and a woman in the attempt to have children. And, uh, you know, we, we still see that in the idea that a marriage has to be consummated, which is the marriage. Uh, so my question was, wait a minute, uh, states make you get a license to get married, and we know that license is official permission to do that, which is otherwise illegal. Now, in the state of Maryland, it is a misdemeanor with a $100 fine to get married without a license. And if you're a pastor and you marry someone and they don't have a license, it's a misdemeanor and a $500 fine. And so I started asking people, when did marriage become illegal? And uh, It appears, I mean, isn't, what other interest does the state have in, or what legitimate interest, I should say, does the state have in interfering in uh, the church's unification of two per- persons in marriage other than the money, uh, seeking to uh, gain some, uh, you know, remuneration through uh, requiring this uh, license to be issued? Is there any a real purpose for the government to be involved in that? The, the only other purpose I could see was it was a way for one state to get around the miscegenation laws of another state. Now, for, for the people who know what miscegenation is, that's uh, people of different races marrying each other. And so some states, it was not only illegal, but uh, there was prison time. So if you moved there and, you know, let's say from a northern state where it wasn't illegal to uh, a state where it was, and Maryland used to have a miscegenation law, uh, you could face having one or both spouses sent to prison. Um, of course, do, do so you... How does, the, how, how does the license, though, if if I'm the state of Maryland, I'm issuing a license to get married, but you're in the state of Virginia or you're in the state of, let's say, Massachusetts, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and you got married and you came to Maryland, uh, how does the license requirement of Maryland stop that marriage that would not have been allowed in Maryland from taking place when they move here? That's an excellent question. And if you go to the Constitution, there's a clause where one state has to give um, 
uh, full faith and credit to the yeah, le- right legal state. recognition to what happened in another state. And so if they licensed it, then the other state couldn't really say anything. Now, I, th- so th- this sets up that there's a legal definition of marriage and there's a natural definition. And, of course, then the United States, uh, to attack Mormon polygamy, also had a, a law on marriage that was upheld by the courts despite the First Amendment and the freedom of religion. And so it set up the basis for what we're experiencing now, where they've changed the legal definition of marriage, and they're going to use the full force of the government to force uh, religious institutions that don't believe that to accept uh, this new definition. Uh, one of the this this question came up when I was in the legislature in the judiciary, and one of one of the solutions that I had offered in trying to uh, find a way to resolve this question was that asking the gay rights community that was in before the legislature, would you accept and uh, that w- if we were to leave marriage with the church, marriage uh, as it's defined is a term that I saw coming historically from the church. It was not something that belonged to the state. If you want to have the state be involved, whether you're heterosexual, you're homosexual, that is uh, an issue for the state, and it stays away from the ecclesiastical uh, courts and decisions and, and, and the history. And it would be civil. Um, you have a, you know, a, a civil union, if you will, um, a domestic partnership, and Anything like that went through the state, the rest went marriage, and they flat out said, no, we won't accept that. And that told me they were after the word marriage. They were not after the equality that came from a unification. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, they, want to, they wanted to co-opt the term marriage, uh, and they wanted to force that on other people, whether uh, they would accept it or not. And they also want to use that as a hammer uh, because there are uh, – there are – uh, laws in certain states, and they want to take that piece of government paper and go in and demand, for example, that the Catholic priest has to marry them. And if they don't, they want to sue them and then try and uh, strip away their uh, uh, you know, tax exemptions or anything else, uh, because the real, the real goal is to destroy marriage, to destroy families, to destroy Christianity. I, I do believe that government has uh, and, and is pursuing a concerted effort in trying to take away the power of the church. Uh, right now, the newest thing you're hearing, and they're using the gay marriage uh, part of that, is to say, well, we're going to take away your tax status if you don't accept this new definition that we've given you. Um, that seems to be a new attack that's tied to this uh, attempt to change uh, through the through, through the government, what uh, the courts have, excuse me, what the uh, church and the uh, uh, religious authorities have uh, for centuries held to be an accepted uh, unification of two persons. Yes, and uh, I mean, th- this was easy to see coming, and I've been speaking against the churches, American churches, taking 501c3 status because under 508, Uh, it is recognized that an American church, because of the First Amendment, is an exception. Now, the difference between an exemption is that the state or that jurisdiction can do something to you, but because of the First Amendment, where there can be no law passed by Congress, the um, an American church is is exempt or, excuse me, is is an exception to the whole thing. And so they can exist as a body, and just by their very purpose, is uh, a not-for-profit and tax-exempt. But most people want, they think somehow the uh, piece of paper that grants them uh, the exemption is more powerful than just declaring themselves a free association uh, under, for religious purposes, and uh, I, existing. You're, you're absolutely right, and, and I think it is a mistake. On, on and where does where is the leadership? I guess amongst theological uh, the bodies to come together and say we need to have this discussion with governmental bodies 
that we're not going to allow this incursion. Um, they allow themselves, the uh, churches, to be told, don't preach uh, politics from the pulpit. Don't unite your members to support the things that bring you together. And by allowing that, it weakens them. And so you don't have a united front going to the polls to say, we won't elect people who threaten our church. And I think that that's the mistake, is we need more preachers, uh, more reverends who are willing to actually preach the politics of their faith from the pulpit. Well, I I agree with you. Um, I know that there's a movement on the left that they want to claim that, well, you have freedom of religion as long as you practice it hidden away inside your uh, church somewhere, inside of a building. But when you come out into the public sphere, you can't do that. You have to do what we say. And th- this is... Uh, uh, what part of the Constitution does that come from? Uh, I think they just made it up. Well, it, it's... it's uh, you, we, we know that there are, there are laws that are based in um, Malum and say that is things are bad by themselves, murder, assault, robbery. But then there's just made up laws, Malum prohibitum, where they just come up with an idea. For example, we're going to outlaw marriage and we're going to demand that you come get a license for it. And the, you know, they, they keep doing this where they have no legitimate uh, authority. I mean, what makes a piece of paper and a declaration by the state better than the dedication of two people in declaring that they're married. And yet somehow people love that piece of paper more than the dedication to the pair bond. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we, we celebrate people that have lived uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, we're just, there was just another example where an elderly couple died in each other's arms. They were married uh, since their early 20s. And everybody celebrated that. It's not the state that, that did that. That's the dedication to the pair bond between them that did that. It's, um, it, it, is, there any, is there any movement within the church and the various uh, uh, denominations to uh, push back against this government intrusion into the theological uh, authority? There is some, although I must say there's there's some uh, uh, organizations like the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that is embracing the new definition of the United Church of Christ is now the uh, uh, Anglican province in America isn't and is pushing back against that because they say there's a traditional understanding of marriage, which is a man and a woman, and we don't care what the state does. That's up to the state, but we as a body... Uh, our understanding is that the couple marries each other, and then we only bless the union in the name of God. Um, th- th- and, and they're aligned with uh, a few other, um, uh, the Reformed Episcopal Church. There's a few other uh, smaller uh, Orthodox bodies that uh, have that view. And, of course, there's the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches that believe that marriage is a the union of a man and a woman, and uh, that... that I, I, there's a problem for the Roman Catholic Church because they won't do it unless you get a license. And I've had people say that, but the Orthodox Church's view is we don't care what the state does, we're going to do what, what our understanding is. And if that means we get out of the marriage business entirely and we only bless couples, then that's what we'll do. Well, here's a, here's a bit of a... Uh, now, I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney 26 years now. So you're, you're raising a um, bit of a dilemma, or not a dilemma, but uh, there's a catch here, the states accept that other states may have common law marriage, which which doesn't require that license. And even though Pennsylvania has common law marriage and Maryland doesn't, they accept it if you come here. When we come back from this commercial break, can we discuss that uh, catch somewhat? uh, We'll be right back after this commercial. All rise. If your problems are legal, call Mike Schmeagle. 1-877-SMI-GIEL. That's one 877 Welcome back. Welcome back to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmeagle. LWRN.net. 
calling in. Join my guest and I at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. Reverend Richard Laney is here with us today. And, uh, Reverend, when we uh, last were speaking before the commercial break, uh, you were telling me about uh, the uh, states requiring the license and that if uh, you don't have this license, then the states are saying that you can't have a legitimate marriage. And I was wondering how that fits in with the fact that we have some states that recognize a common law marriage, such as Pennsylvania. And while Maryland does not recognize the common law marriage, it allows somebody who was in a state that had a common law marriage to come here and be recognized as being married. Would this not be somewhat of a uh, hypocritical position of the states to hold it against the churches, yet they allow the exact same practice to take place, why shouldn't the churches be able to uh, issue marriages without licenses if they choose to do so? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and, of course, we know that uh, before the colonies were free, uh, the we were under the rule of the Crown, and the Church of England uh, had their own courts for canon law, and marriage was a function of the Church of England. And it was licensed there, uh, so there was a law for the nobility, there was canon law, and then there was what's called common law, the law that was applied to the common people. And nobody really cared what they did, so if uh, a common couple held themselves out as married, the courts held that they were married. Um, And so when we became independent, the canon law as part of the civil law went away, and so there was common law in all of the colonies and this persisted up for, for most up through the start of the Progressive Era when they started passing these marriage laws, uh, of course, because the common law recognition is a legitimate act of, let's say, the state of Pennsylvania um, or the District of Columbia, which came out of Maryland and but retained that, then another state has to recognize that. Uh, so in... In those states that have that, the churches just practice uh, a marriage ceremony. They they hold it and uh, you know they give them a church certificate and and so they they do do that. Uh, it is rather hypocritical for one state, uh, and I'll pick on Maryland again, where they um, make pastors agents of the state. So in Maryland, the only people that can marry someone is a judge. A, a clerk that's delegated by the judge and someone from a religious dom- denomination where uh, the person is authorized by that. So r- really what that says is, um, let's say you're from the uh, the um, Satanic Temple, yeah. and you come to Maryland, you're allowed to do marriages. It also seems to me that you've the ecclesiastical authority that went around, that went before government, um, now has allowed itself to be controlled by government. As you were talking earlier, um, they can tell you now, well, you, you have to do, we're going to, there's a, there's a move on to limit your ability to practice your religion or to say that we don't recognize same sex at, at church or at home, but not in your business where you say you don't want to make the cake. My concern here now is that um, we, first off, we'd never do this with a reporter. We wouldn't say you have the ability to have the freedom to write what you want, but you can only uh, practice um, your trade uh, as a sports writer or as a, you know, writing novels. We would never limit it. Um, the, the, I guess the concern now is if, if we've allowed the state to say that you have to have this license, haven't the churches given up their ability to um have a freedom of religion. Once you say you can license me in any aspect of my religious belief, you've acquiesced in uh, giving up a right that sh- should be an inalienable right that comes from God. It does not come from the government. And I would think that the uh, First Amendment would act as a prohibition on government requiring licenses of churches. I don't understand how they're able to get around that. Well, I I agree with you. And so, for example, I refuse to act as an agent of the state and sign those licenses. I know other I know of pastors in Maryland that ignore the law entirely and they hold marriage ceremonies and they just marry people and give them their own certificate. 
Um, the, however, there is a mindset among certain pastors where they love that idea that they have this authority from the state, and they love the idea that, ooh, um, now I can marry people. They really like that, and it's baffling to me why they think that's uh, so such a good thing, where you're right, the authority should be coming from God through the Holy Spirit and then uh, exercised among the people as the Spirit moves the pastor. Um, you, you know, so it, let's say well, originally the, the law envisioned that you had uh, mainline uh, denominations, uh, rabbis, uh, things like that that would be practicing this. They never envisioned the plurality of of religious thought out there, which is fine. Uh, you know, the the uh, the pastafarians, the, uh, the the pagans, the neo pagans, and others like that. We have freedom of religion, and so they can practice that. But I don't think the uh, writers of the law ever envisioned that type of thing, and the marriage chaos, because in Maryland, all you have to do is assert your authority, and you can sign a marriage license. And if you want to, you can download a certificate off the, uh, off the Internet. It'd take a couple of minutes, and you can wave that around if you want. Um, where, where, where's the meeting of, of churches of you know, either the same denomination or various denominations coming together and saying, we're just going to deny the state the ability to uh, dictate to us that we. It seems like you're subjugating the authority of God to man when you say we'll allow the government to tell us how we can operate under uh, our, our, you know, our religion. And, and I would think that if I'm an ecclesiastical leader. I would say no. We just, you know, civil disobedience. It's not, you know, there's no aggression there. But we're going to marry couples, and we're, you know, um, I, I, I think, and I, I guess I shouldn't. But when you're looking at freedom of religion, you have to take all religions and give them all their freedom. But you, I remember the Reverend Sun Young Moon would stand out there with ten thousand people and marry them, and I doubt that each of them had, you know, a civil license from the state uh, as he was doing that. I don't understand why the churches. Don't come together and say, you know what, all of us are going to stand together, and we will um, decide that you know the, the authority of God is higher than that of government or man. Well, as I said, there, there are some that are pushing back, but most, uh, most denominations were either denying what was happening or it never really hit them until the Supreme Court came out with the ruling. Now, I, I, I anticipated the Supreme Court ruling and uh, was, you know, I've been warning people of you've got some delegates in the Michigan state legislature that wanted to rewrite the marriage laws, and I emailed them and voiced my concerns. Uh, they wanted to bring back the common law marriage, but they wanted to demand that uh, couples that were going to just marry under the common law had to come in and register. And, in fact, they had to come in, fill out a form, and, and provide even a Social Security number. And it's like, well, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? Um, of course, we know that the federal government has mandated uh, that for all licensing in the states. Um, uh, do you, do you, you know, need a license to be baptized? No, you don't. You come in and, and uh, you know, depending on the uh, denomination, um, if it's parents, they bring in a baby. If it's an older child... Uh, they request baptism, or if it's an adult, they just say, I believe, and, and I want to be baptized. And they might question you on your faith, and then they just do it, and they give you a baptismal certificate. Um, and and if, you, if you go through the uh, state, various stages that different churches have, such as uh, catechism and such, you don't need any license for any of that to be a uh, membership of the church, correct? No, you don't. Now, I, I know someone that went to the um, Archbishop of Baltimore because they wanted the Roman Catholic Church to marry them without a license, and they wouldn't. And he asked the archbishop, tell me what other sacrament of the church requires state permission to perform? And the archbishop of that, at that time said, we won't talk about it. Now, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> well, you know, I, I support other denominations in their beliefs, and I would support the, um, the ability of the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church 
that believes it's a sacrament of the church to marry people without government interference. But this is the only right I know of where you have to have the government permission to perform. And as I said, it's a misdemeanor in the state of Maryland to do it, and it's a $500 fine. That's not freedom of religion. I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I find another interesting irony is that had the government not tried to create the gay rights movement as a civil right, but left it as a religious right, freedom of religion, you would have had the same arguments that we watch with the Tenth Amendment in states developing the um, the growth of new ideas and experimenting with them, and some religions would reject and accept what others had done as we were having, and it was taking place with that gay rights issue. You had the Episcopal Church say, we will accept same-sex marriages. That's up to that church and their beliefs, whether or not they want to do that. If not, a church doesn't have to, and a person who chooses, I don't want to be a member of this church because I disagree with that, I'm going to join a new church, you would have developed, through the freedom of religion, the ability to address that situation, where by forcing it on everyone, I think you create down the road a much larger um, confrontation between the authority of God and the authority of man. Uh, yes, you're, you're right. Of course, the state uh, having force on its side, uh, they believe that the force of the, uh, the threats of the state will carry the day. Um, well, the, Pope John Paul was able to help bring down, you know, and Solidar- Solidarnesk was able to bring down the, uh, the communists in uh, Poland without firing a shot. And so uh, I think it just takes, you're going to have to have a leader willing to stand up in some denomination uh, and, and others. And, and, and you see it at the local level. And, and I, I'm always much more, uh, I'm encouraged to see when a reverend or a preacher stands up at the pulpit and says, we're not supposed to talk about this today, and here's why we're going to talk about it. What I've been advocating is, uh, what you're saying is, it, it, if people want to be married in a church, they just go into the church, the church does what it does, and gives them a certificate. If they want that certificate recognized by the state, they can take it down to the courthouse and have it recorded as a legal document. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And in that way, if they then go to another place or anything and somebody says, you know, you have to prove that you're married, they can take that out, and then it's a function of the church or whatever. And if people don't belong to a church and they want to have a civil union, they can go in and create a document in front of a notary public, is like the justice of the peace, and that's uh, – uh, you know, that's notarized, and then they can have that recorded at the uh, courthouse, and it would have the same effect. Uh, in, in essence, a marriage by contract, which was what it used to be. It was a private affair. It was a private contract between the couple or families. And, um, and, and in fact, the, uh, the uh, Jewish uh, people still have uh, written in Hebrew usually what they call a ketubah, or a ketuba deed, it's the writing, and that's the marriage contract, and it hangs up on the wall. And that, that you know, it's, it's uh, a standard thing, what the husband and the wife are supposed to do for each other. And when Jesus said, give her her paper, if you're going to divorce her, that's what he was talking about. You take that uh, down that and you... giving the gap? Pardon? Is that the gap, giving her the paper? You give the gap under the Jewish religion um, in order to get the divorce? Oh, okay. Right. There's specified performance. If you're going to divorce her, then there's things you have to give her. Oh, okay. She doesn't go away empty-handed. Well, uh, we'll be right back uh, after this commercial, uh, Reverend, and uh, enjoy this great conversation. And hopefully we'll have some callers who call in and they have some questions to uh, discuss. Uh, We'll look forward to you joining us when we get back uh, from this commercial break. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Smeagol, LWRN.net. You can call in and join my guest and I at 410-848-9191. I'm here with the Reverend Richard Laney. Reverend, um, what 
do you think the solutions are right now? What can we do to fight back? What can the people who are listening, um, who are concerned about this do? What do you preach uh, from the pulpit that others should uh, start to do to stop this incursion by the government uh, into our religious freedom? Well, that's that's good question here. Uh, there are several things that I've been advocating. Uh, one is that uh, American churches should not be 501c3s. Uh, of course, if, if you talk to a lot of, uh, of accountants and things like that, that's the first thing they tell you. Uh, we were going to get a bank account in Virginia, and the bank said, you have to be a 501c3. Instead, we got one in Maryland that didn't, that didn't demand that so that we didn't have to be. Uh, the other one is that uh, the pastors should uh, should not act as agents of the state and should start refusing to marry people. If they would boycott the system, the system would stand up and take notice. Um, the other thing is that we should advocate that the marriage laws in the states be done away with, that uh, – you know that that that's if it's a function of the church, the churches have religious freedom and they should be able to do it, um, and to to separate that out. The um, of course, some of these things are still controversial and not popular. I got, I was, I actually raised the idea of 501c3 uh, being bad in a paper, and the professor downgraded me for that <laughs> because he didn't agree. Um, it's uh, uh, you've got major Christian universities that I guess if they don't recognize um, uh, a same-sex couple and provide them married accommodation or anything, they're going to lose their uh, status. Um, in, in, well, in their just, people a that are... just a question, since you 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 piqued my curiosity, let's let's say I take away your 503 sat status. Why do you not automatically then revert to the 508? exemption that you can't do anything to me even if I don't have my 503 status because I'm automatically exempt under the 508. Well, there there are churches that have tried that in the IRS, um, actually in the case of the Indiana Baptist Temple, which was a, a very uh, large congregation and uh, was written up uh, by Dr. Elmer Towns in uh, his 10 largest uh, Sunday schools, uh, a book that he wrote. Um, was sued by the IRS. They took their property and they sold it because they they uh, got rid of their 501c3 status and were claiming 508. Because once you enter the system, they won't let you go. But if you start anew, then you can start up. And, and because, uh, for example, Benevolence Church has never been a 501c3, and uh, we've never been uh, contacted by the IRS or any other any other people, even though we're uh, operating openly and notoriously, as as the one lawyer said, um, that we're hardly without notice. But because we've never asked for that, and we claim that we are a not for profit and that we are an exception, uh, we've never been harassed. It's it's just one of those things. Yeah. They 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 convince you I'm to take the paper, and then you can't you can't get rid of it. Yeah, who is they? I mean, is is it when you go to the banks that they tell you that in order to do this, you have to be, a, you know, set up this way? Is it the accountants, the lawyers? Uh, it, who is it that's pushing? And, and I would it, guess, I would ask. The, the, it's all of those, and it's, and it's also the states. So, yes, accountants do it. Lawyers do it. Uh, the banks will try and get you to do it. And if you ask the state, the state will tell you you have to do it. Even though, um, okay, Benevolence Church doesn't own any property right now, under Maryland law, a church that um, is using, uh, that owns and uses property for church purposes is tax exempt, meaning that they could uh, have property taxes levied against them that the state chooses not to because they view churches as a social good. Um, so, uh, should, should there be a push then from the pulpit um, across America to go to the Congress and have them uh, say that the 508 status can be uh, entered into after you set up the 5013C, or that's the fallback position of any 
religious organization, could we not change this so that you can't yes, we have could. The, yes. We, we, okay. we could, and, and that is a very good point, and that is something we ought to do. Um, the, the IRS doesn't confer 508. 508 is the um, default for American churches, American religious organizations, that by definition they are an exception and that they are not-for-profits and, and, and the Congress can't regulate them. Um, and, and yes, that the probably would take some intervention by Congress to tell the IRS to back off. Because what happens, of course, is the IRS writes regulations that then have the effect of law. And whether you agree with them or not, it doesn't matter. They will come down on you with the full force of the Department of Justice. I, I thought one of the interesting things in the whole uh, nationally, the debate on the gay rights that took place was in Utah. And what they did in Utah was where they said, okay, we're going to take up the question of gay rights and the religious freedom for the churches and their protections at the same time. So they put them both together, and they made both sides sit down and do the quid pro quo so that when the bill passed, both sides knew what they were giving up and getting. And they actually passed the two bills together so that everybody who was opposed to this had given up something in order to get what they wanted for the protections. And I just thought that that was an interesting way. I don't know if you watched that or had any comment on how they approached it in Utah and seemed to get a very conservative religious state that was willing to um, make some changes, but they were, did so at the same time they were protecting the church. Well, I, I did see that, and um, I, I must say that even though uh, that the LDS church is conservative, they also stand for religious freedom, and so they understand that. Um, uh, having been a persecuted group, they don't want to, uh, you know, they have that in their psyche, and so that helped them sit down and make out compromises, like you pointed out. That would be a wonderful thing in other states. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that some states are incapable of doing that, that they don't have the political will to do it, uh, even, even though the uh, churches in those states should... Uh, should push the legislature for that. But I don't think many churches actually make their voices heard. Uh, they're, they're scared or uh, the, they're, they want to shy away from controversy. Uh, you know, even if they support, uh, like you said, the Episcopal Church, they're willing to accept it and they support that. Um, the, they should stand for the religious freedom of other churches to abstain from it. And that's one of the things that I notice is, uh, in the name of religious freedom, they won't support the religious freedom of others. Well, it's yes. curious. I, th I think the main thing missing in religion these days is tolerance. Uh, it seems to be the one thing that, you know, uh, I, I do not find enough of. And it, it was interesting in the legislature. You were allowed to get up, and you can say just about anything except for um, the name of Jesus from the, you know, from from when you're standing before the legislature. Um, it, it, I'm not, I apologize. It brought, brings up one other thing that you had brought up, um, with the common law and how it had come about from uh, previously. But was not the common law based on the Ten Commandments? Uh, no. Well, it, it th that was certainly in there because, of course, the Ten Commandments was the uh, basis for a decent civil society. You know, don't, don't steal other people's stuff. Don't lie. Uh, don't, don't take your neighbor's wife and, and cause uh, jealousy. Um, y y y you go and look at that, and it's just the common sense uh, rules for civility. Uh, I don't see why it's so hard. And so that was the basis for uh, the common law, and that's why there were common law crimes, because we knew that murder was wrong. Uh, beating up your uh, someone was wrong. Taking their stuff was wrong. Breaking into their house was wrong. You know, all those things are, are wrong in and of themselves. Could, could I get your sight? Could I get your um, thoughts and insights on a current uh, fear that I have today, and I'm watching as the growth of Sharia law or its acceptance or its push for acceptance. And one of the uh, recently, I just heard that they're looking to change the way they give mortgages in one state so that they can give uh, mortgages free of any uh, interest to certain families. And we, while we have this push, at least on 
Western religions, it seems to be, to not allow them the same freedom, we seem to be pushing to give more freedom to the thought of allowing Sharia law uh, to be accepted. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that, that's a that's a good question here. The um, of course, what they're trying to do is they're they're trying to implement uh, what was in the Quran. Um, but of course, we know that Sharia law is really the whim based on uh, people applying that. Uh, the prohibition against interest used to go to uh, 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 people of Jewish origin and Christians. That kind of went away. You didn't pay interest, but you paid fees, because of course the the loan of the money it has a, a value in the consideration. Um, now, in the in the United States, you can use uh, any ideal to contract with, and so they can contract with that. But what they want is they want then an alternate court system where they rule on it, and they don't want to take that into the civil courts and have uh, the Sharia analyzed and applied by uh, people that are not Muslims. And and that's wrong. You can't have an alternate court system. That's what they're trying to have. Now, they could have binding arbitration, and they could set up their own, um, arbit- you know, their, their own panels for arbitration, but they don't want to do that. Because w- part of jihad is that you go in, you get, um, you get, your own separate legal system and everything, and then you try and apply that to everybody, and that's their end game. Is they want to force Absolutely. they want to force Christians to then live by Sharia, and and that's antithetical to Christianity. Reverend, it's been a, a fantastic uh, interview. I, I really appreciate your insights, and I'm sure a lot of other people would learn love to learn more about. Uh, your thoughts on uh, these subjects, and how would they go about getting in touch with you, uh, being able to follow you, and be able to learn more about what's going on uh, with the things that are uh, happening in the theological world? Uh, Could you give us some information on how we can follow you? Well, they can uh, go to benevolencechurch.org on the web, um, and there's... uh, there's a uh, address where they can uh, send a letter. Um, we had some other uh, contact information up, but unfortunately uh, that was abused by some people, so I, I haven't reposted that. But, uh, you know, we will respond to letters. We will help you set up, for example, a house church. If you're in an area where you don't have uh, an organi- uh, a congregation that fits your theological uh, thoughts, we, we'll help you do that. Um, we'll help Get, get you connected with other people in the area, um, or if there are some, for example, I mentioned the Anglican province in America, which is becoming uh, large. They are looking to expand, and they are a very orthodox, continuing um, uh, church in the apostolic succession. I'm more than willing to help you do that. Uh, that that's, it, as you said, tolerance. Uh, you know, I know people that, um, for example, I have some friends that are atheists, and I tell them, I don't believe in atheism. And the one he just laughs, he thinks that's great because he's Reverend, a tolerant individual. I, I apologize for getting ready to go. I want to oh, well. thank you for a great show, and I'd love to have you back. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us at the Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmeagle, LWRN.net. We'll look forward to talking with you next week. Thank you very much. All rise. If your problems are legal, call Mike Schmiegel. 1-877-SMI-GIEL. That's 1-877-SMI-GIEL. Remember, if your problems are legal, call Mike Schmiegel. 1-877-SMI-GIEL. The following program has been pre recorded. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now, live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network.
back to the Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmeagle and Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net. You can call in and join my guest, David Benner, who is talking about his new book, Compact of the Republic, The League of States and the Constitution. Um, the number you would call in is 410-848-9191. Uh, David, I uh, want to thank you very much, and I want to um, – we've got – uh, for joining us for this next se- 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 segment. Uh, so if you want to call in, you've got till uh, 5.15 to be able to call in and speak with um, Mr. Benner before he um, uh, has to go. And I wanted to really take a moment just to thank you. Uh, I was very humbled and appreciative of the fact that you included me in your book. I was surprised, uh, and the way I found out about it was uh, one of our constituents, I guess, who had read your book, um, sent me a quick note and said, hey, you got to take a look at this, and I uh, thank you very much. That was uh, flattering and uh, nice to know that somebody outside the state of Maryland was paying attention. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of a coincidental meeting between us, but uh, I was definitely proud to highlight you and uh, your role in introducing especially the legislation in Maryland, which would have confronted the NSA directly for its unconstitutional behavior. So. And, and that was from, and that comes out of the Tenth Amendment Foundation. Um, uh, I believe they're headquartered in Florida, is it? Yeah, um, the NSA maintains several facilities throughout the U.S. I think that the one in Maryland is the largest, though. Is that correct? No, no, I, I, I understand that. No, I meant the Tenth Amendment Foundation, who would contact. Oh yes, the, to, the to Tenth Amendment bill. Center is based in California. Absolutely, we're a small okay. think tank, but we're definitely an active one, and we're at the forefront of state nullification, and that's fighting against unconstitutional behavior of the federal government. The states have to stand up for that. You're absolutely right, and I, and I think educating. Uh, we have a, a very well-known commissioner out here in Carroll County, uh, um, Commissioner Rothschild, who uh, is uh, one who goes around educating people on nullification, and I think that that's something that your organization does a, a great job at, and uh, we need to notify more people of uh, just how much power there is in the word no. Um, you know, it's not a word the federal government wants to hear, but it's one that they should hear. Um, one of the things, I've, uh, what are some of the suggestions you have for fixing some of these problems, if, if any? Um, one that I've always thought is, you know, it seems to me very, very simple, and we've heard uh, some of the liberty groups asking for is any legislation that's passed should have a citation to its constitutional authority. I think, you know, that would be uh, an easy way to start is where do you get the authority to do this and to see um, what uh, they're able to come up with. Yeah, I mean, that should be the starting point for any any legislation, like you make note. But uh, as far as what can people do and what solutions there are, um, I'm a historian, so I don't claim to have every political solution. But what I would say is I think it is wise for individuals to actually – to, and it may sound counterintuitive, but to stop focusing, hyper-focusing on federal elections and federal politicians and instead to focus on local uh, leaders and trying to convince them to stand up to bad federal policy instead of hoping that the power apparatus that grows around Washington is all of a sudden going to change their beat because we've seen that both parties in power have not always done that. I mean, the House of Representatives just elected as their leader, John Boehner, who has been very complicit with most of Obama's aims. So what hope do we have? And there's some exceptions to that, but I think if people throw more resources, more time and encouragement into their their state battles against the federal government, we would be at a much better place in uh, a much better republic. I, I could not agree more, and one of the starting points is uh, just look at the fact that our local sheriffs and the power that a local sheriff has and how the federal government wants to try to displace that lawmaking authority from the local uh, person who lives there and give it to um, those who may not have uh, community ties. Um, I think that it's important that our local sheriffs remain uh, locally elected and given as much power as possible as far as the final our ar- ar- of uh, what is and is not um, the law in the counties. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't know if you know Richard Mack, but he runs an excellent uh, constitutional sheriff organization that, you know, really tries to educate local sheriffs and make them 
aware that they don't have to accept the impressment of some of this policy. So I think you're absolutely right. Now, and now, who more is, shares. Well, why don't you give us that name again so anybody who's out here listening who has um, that information can go to their sheriff and say, hey, go get this or give that information to their sheriff. Who is that um, that they would contact and what organization would that be? Yeah, Richard Mack uh, has an organization called CSPOA. So I believe if you Google CSPOA, just the letters, you'll find information on that. But he, he travels throughout the country and educates local sheriffs on different aspects of the Constitution and really uh, educates sheriffs on how to exercise civil disobedience against their bad policies. And I think you're absolutely right that sheriffs are invaluable to preserving the liberty of individuals. Um, we've had, when the last election we went around and we asked each sheriff well, you know, one question, will you agree to nullify any unconstitutional law, including, which was SB 281 in Maryland, which was the new gun law, which was uh, O'Malley trying to uh, pretty much infringe upon the ownership of anybody in Maryland of any kind of uh, firearm, and they outlawed uh, what they call assault weapons, which um, is just a cluster of errors. <laughs> um, and I, I just could go on, and I don't want to bloviate here on that because that's not what we're talking about here today. But um, we had several sheriffs who said, yes, um, I will not enforce these illegal um, activities. And, you know, one of the things that I stood on the floor and said um, to the legislature, which I think is important to put your toes on the line, you don't always know how thick the line is, but you've got to put your toes out there. And um, I stood on the floor and said that I will stand side by side with the citizens of Maryland and nullify any act from this legislature, any order from any executive, and any court order that in any way interferes with the Second Amendment. Um, these, this is a right that comes from God, and I can remember getting people laughed when I said the right comes from God, and I said, no, this, the Second Amendment is a prohibition on government being able to interfere with that inalienable right. And they don't seem to understand. They think that, you know, the federal government gives us our rights, and that's a basic misconception of people who are elected to represent us. Yes, that's absolutely true. As, P as you are aware, the Bill of Rights especially is just ex a list of explicit limitations on rights that already were acknowledged to exist when that was written. So you're absolutely correct. What, what, what things have you seen, or as a student of history, um, that have been effective in the past? Well, um, I'm sure we've veered off the path of uh, liberty several times in different ways, and what have you seen as ways that we've corrected that that we can learn lessons from? I think one of the most vital is something that James Madison wrote about in Federalist 46, and he prescribed a two-step solution. And on an individual level, he said that, quote, a refusal to cooperate with officers of the union would lead to the preservation of liberty. And when it came to states and how they perceive violations, they should, quote, create obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to endure. So I really urge your listeners to take a look at what Madison said about this in Federalist 46, because it's absolutely timeless. Madison was right, and those principles were used in the Civil Rights era. It was used to stop the Alien and Sedition Acts during the Federalist Congress and in many other places in American history. I would say that wasn't too far removed from what we were doing. I know that Utah, um, as well as Maryland, um, are placing uh, threats to restrictions on the access to water and electricity for the NSA if they spy on Americans without obtaining warrants. And I could not get our fellow uh, legislators to understand um, it could be any more simple. What is wrong with getting a warrant? The federal law, you know, the, you can spy on people. Get a warrant. Go, go before a judge and give your probable cause of why there's a necessity to do this, and there's a process for it. And saying we're going to set up secret courts <laughs> that will determine whether or not you have uh, the authority is not the answer, which was uh, interesting that came out of the federal, um, I think the federal uh, Congress was looking at, oh, well, we'll let them set up secret courts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, secret courts and the FISA courts are pretty much one of the most pernicious 
institutions that's that's grown up over the last 40 years or so and for the exact reasons as you specified and going back historically i pointed out some cases where you know these these treacherous kings would just completely eliminate all opposition against them by indefinitely holding people uh killing them sometimes torturing them at various times and there's reasons that there is a requirement for warrants so that the state does not become too powerful to infringe on everyone's liberty if it wants so, is there hope? <laughs> what you um, I, right? I think there is What's some hope. Right? Yeah. What's going right? What are what, what are we doing right out there right now? I think education and messaging campaigns are going a lot better in the last few years when it comes to the founding principles and resistance efforts and active activism and personalized education. Um, on these topics. I can't say that the political aspects are always going great, but I am. I do remain hopeful that more people get interested in foundational history. They get interested in things like Austrian e- e- economics. They get interested in, yeah. like, the non-aggression principle, things like that. So, Well, I, I do think that one of the problems that we have is, uh, as you say, with, with education, I see the, the availability through um, radio, the free internet, the um, things that we have uh, available for the press, and to get information out there is great. But when I look at what's taking place in our public school systems and the way that they have uh, gone so far to the left, and it seems almost to be, um, you know, sedition to talk about freedom, to talk about liberty, to talk about the Constitution. Um, it's amazing how far we've gone from our founding principles now in our basic uh, free education system. Yeah, I think I think that sometimes I step back and say, I can't believe how big of a conflict of interest it is to have the state control every aspect of an individual's education. But uh, sometimes I don't think a lot of people think about that, and it's definitely worth considering. And you made a very good note that, you know, there's all sorts of new ways in the media to disseminate information like podcasts and your own radio show. So there's there's definitely avenues to remain hopeful for, if for nothing and, else. Uh, and and how, how, how's the Liberty Movement out there? You're in Minnesota, correct, sir? Yes, sir. And, and so uh, how's the Liberty Movement out there in Minnesota? Uh, how's your state doing uh, with uh, uh, addressing some of these concerns you had? <laughs> I, uh, the liberty movement in the state is not especially strong, I would say, compared to some others. However, there is a liberty base of dedicated individuals and a few positive pieces of legislation that have come out. And in our current session, I think the most important is one that will completely protect electronic data from being seized uh, without a warrant and make it inadmissible in court cases. And I don't know if your state is considering something um, like that or already I, has, but that – I'm. Pr- yeah, I'm proud to say the last session we passed three of the strongest protections in the country um, where I worked actually with the ACLU and two very liberal law professors, and I worked with another conservative, uh, um, Senator Shank, and we were able to pass. The first was uh, most people don't know that anything that's over 18 months old, that is an electronic um that you have stored your email and such, the federal government can go in or any government can go and look at because you're deemed under – the uh, courts to have been abandoned um, and without a warrant they can look at. And so we were able to say, not in Maryland, you need a warrant. The second was they can't ping your phone and trace you without a warrant, unless, except unless there's exigent circumstances. And the third was to stop the use of those license plate readers. But, David, uh, we're about ready to uh, end here for this segment. I want to thank you very much for coming on. Um, I'm going to look forward to uh, reading the rest of your book. And we'd love to have you uh, back again any time that an issue comes up on Liberty. Uh, you've been very informative guests, and thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Michael. I'll be glad to come. Welcome back to the Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmiegel. We're here on Liberty Works Radio Network, LWRN.net, and you can call in and join us at 
410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. And we are happy to have had our guest, Mr. David Benner, with us to talk about the Compact of the Republic, the League of States, and the Constitution. Um, I've started the book. I very much enjoy it. And if you enjoy reading about uh, the Constitution and how our country was formed and to see some of the arguments that show why we are a federalist system, a group of states and sovereign uh, units that maintain their individuality versus uh, coming together to form a national system where uh, the states lose that individuality, which is what uh, obviously the federal government in Washington, D.C., um, and that uh, monster that uh, exists there uh, as far as the creation of a overbearing uh, government uh, where the regulations that come out of the agencies that exceed the authority to even be set up are strangling our ability to uh, grow and uh, to have commerce uh, progress in this nation. It's a great insight and gives you arguments so when you stand there uh, with others, um, you'll be able to argue from a historical standpoint of why it is that we are a federalist system and that how the individuality of uh, the various states uh, should be maintained. And it's good to see the states of Texas are standing up. Uh, have, uh, whether you agree or disagree with the idea of the decriminalization or legalization of marijuana, the idea that a state is sovereign enough to stand up to the federal government and say, you don't have that power, you don't have that right, you cannot infringe upon our ability to experiment in this area with whether or not we uh, want to allow our citizens the ability to um, either have marijuana available for uh, medical reasons or we want to decriminalize it so that it's not a crime but treat it as a health matter, or we want to legalize it so that uh, people can, if they wish to enjoy it for simply a um, the same way they would an alcoholic drink, that they're free to do so. So depending on how deep your libertarian streak goes, that uh, if you agree that that's something that the individual states should be able to do, and if you don't like it, you can change what your state does or move to another state, then uh, you should be able to uh, enjoy this book and use those arguments as a method for being able to buttress um, your future arguments for similar ideas, uh, no matter where it goes. A few years back, uh, people talked about how to get rid of how do we get rid of welfare? How do you stop the um, uh, growth of the welfare system? And now it's totally just um, gone beyond what anybody would have ever imagined in the size of the welfare system under the Obama administration. But um, I believe it was back in the uh, may have been in the 80s when uh, it was Wisconsin who first set out the you know workfare um, and that you were going to work to be able to get your welfare and that you uh, would be ways to retrain them and get people off the welfare system. And it worked, and it became the model for the nation. And so there are many times where states have experimented with something, it has worked out or it hasn't worked out, and that's the idea of the federalist system. You have uh, these 50 different states that can come together, and um, if they like an idea and something that's worked in one state, they can emulate it, modify it, and you're able to grow. It should not be as we have uh, currently with, uh, let's say, the um, new education system, Common Core. This is not something that came out of a group of governors saying that, oh, we want this and this is what we would like. This is something that the federal government said, no, this is the way we're going to implement that. And, and, and the lies that are told when they tell you, oh, you have the right to change uh, the system, no, 5% of what's coming down as the mandates on education from the federal government with the Common Core can be changed. For the other 95% or so, you're not allowed to change. They have to stay the same. Uh, so when those kinds of dictates come down and they are able, through the use of money, tying, uh, if you want funds, you want to get things uh, to 
your roads or whatever it is that uh, the funding is tied to, uh, then you have to agree to capitulate to allow the federal government to dictate to you. That's wrong. That's coercion. It's uh, blackmail. It's uh, just inappropriate for the federal government to even be involved in it in the first place. And to say, you know, it's like saying to a man, would you rather have a stick in the eye or a kick in the groin? And because you decide to take the kick in the groin, they say that's something you asked for. Well, it's not what you asked for. It was the lesser of the two evils that was offered you, and uh, most people didn't want the stick in the eye. And so the federal government shouldn't be in a position to use our taxpayer dollars to force us to accept uh, positions that we otherwise uh, would not allow the federal government to put upon us, and the federal government knows that it's not allowed to put upon us. So if um, these are things that interest you in talking about the federalism versus the nationalism, um, I suggest uh, pick up the book, give it a read, and uh, it's a good place to uh, start. Um, one of the things that uh, has been bothering me that I watched coming out this last week, which uh, was with the 21 Coptic Christians that uh, were taken out and uh, killed in a systematic way by the Islamic terrorists. And the way that our government addressed it by saying that there were 21 Egyptians uh, who were in, uh, I believe, Libya, um, who were uh, killed. Uh, this clearly is not the reason that they were killed, not because they were migrant workers, not because they had come uh, to Libya. They were killed because they were Christians. They were told they were uh, uh, chosen because they were Coptic Christians. They were, uh, had their throats slit because they were Christians. Um, and for our government not to recognize this is absolutely unconscionable. It's become so that when I see the person stand up there at the podium and speak on behalf of the administration, I expect that what they're going to tell me is a lie full of spins. I don't even expect the truth anymore. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't tell you the last time that I was able to look at any spokesman for the United States government who came out there and say, well, what I, I want to find out what's going on. Um, it just doesn't exist anymore. There's no shame in lying to the American public. There seems to be no shame in lying to themselves. I don't even believe they believe what they tell us anymore. When they come out and they refuse and they hear the entire world condemning them, the United States, for its failure to lead, when the United States refuses to use the words that these are Islamic terrorists, this is a religious war. It's been declared against us. Um, to expect us to accept this argument that, well, we have to close down Guantanamo Bay because it's a reason that those who are uh, terrorizing us and terrorizing others, um, it gives them strength and, and, and a motivation to do so. Well, that's just absolute um, malarkey. There's no way that our, our mere existence is our freedom, um, our ability to practice the religions that we choose, uh, to live side by side with uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, Christians, uh, Hindu, any uh, religion in this country, or no religion, is a threat to the Islamic uh, terrorists out there. And so for them to say that somehow Guantanamo Bay is uh, responsible for uh, giving them uh, hope or, or, or creating uh, people uh, wanting to run and join the uh, ISIS groups or other uh, al-Qaeda is absolutely ridiculous. Um, our mere existence gives that same motivation. And would we give up our freedoms or give up um, our uh, existence because the Muslim terrorists find it offensive? No. There's only one way to address this situation, and that is to put an end to those who have no regard for human life 
and that offer two choices, submit or die. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie Independence Day, but in that movie there's a scene where the president is uh, talking to a alien from outer space, goes to the window, and they're using some sort of telepathy, and he looks at this alien and he asks him, you know, is there a way we can live in harmony? Well, you know, what, what, what do you want from us? What can we do? And the alien just answers, die. There is no way to bargain with, negotiate with, to try to uh, uh, appease these Islamic terrorists. They are living in the 7th century uh, with a, a mentality that says that it's okay to do the most horrific, horrible things to human beings um, in some way of appeasing or honoring your God by lighting human beings on fire and uh, letting them die the most horrendous death uh, that you can imagine. And it wasn't just this one Jordanian pilot. Apparently, now we find out that there was over 40-some people that were systematically and almost in a, um, I, I don't want to, it's a ritualistic way of torturing them. The soldiers stand around and they're, you know, enthralled by watching this uh, torture. This is supposed to um, somehow appeal to the most uh, base and uh, horrific uh, sides of a human being that anybody would find this to be some sort of motivation for going out there and joining this organization. Um, this is extremely uh, scary in that these people now are saying, don't come join us, don't come out here to the Middle East, stay at home. If you like us, emulate us, do what we're doing. And so the thought that we're going to have people walk down the street and decide that they want to behead somebody, that they want to try to take somebody and put them on fire, they want to do some other horrific thing to try to emulate these um, uh, subhuman um, individuals is horrendous. And there's only one answer, and what the President of the United States needs to do, which he'll never do, but what needs to be done is somebody turn to our military and say, defeat them. Tell us what you need. Tell us where uh, where you need support and go do that. And Congress, where is our leadership in Congress? How can they possibly be taking 10 days off to go home and visit with their families when the entire world is burning up around them? And whether it's the Middle East, we, we've, how many embassies have we just lost? You know, we just had Liberty. Uh, Libya is uh, about to fall. Um, we've had Somalia fall. Um, you know, we've got um, the Middle East is uh, losing all of the ter territories as the caliphate uh, grows. The borders are gone. Uh, you go into what used to be Syria um, and Iraq. Uh, those borders are gone, the Kurds are hanging on, and is the United States there to support them? No. Where's our support for our allies? If you cannot be uh, supportive of the very people who are going to fight for you on the ground, then who can you support? You know, what can we do? Anyway, uh, we'll be right back in a moment at Liberty Works Radio Network. Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmiegel, LWRN.net. Call in at 410-848-9191. Your network. Welcome back to Freedom Forum with Delegate Mike Schmiegel from Liberty Works Radio Network. You can call in at 410-848-9191. That's 410-848-9191. And we're here with our next guest, Eugene Craig, who is calling in to tell us about the attempts to stop a rain tax uh, and the implementation of one in Baltimore County. Eugene, you want to tell us about that? Eugene? 
Hey, Mike. Hey, how you doing, Eugene? Well, doing pretty good, pretty guest, good. Uh, what's going on with the rain tax in Baltimore County? Well, we have 72 hours to stop it, to kill it. Okay. To make sure it never sees the last day again. Can you say that again? Can you repeat that for me? Yeah, please. Tell us what's going on. Well, on Tuesday at 2 p.m. in Towson, Maryland, the Baltimore County Council is uh, looking at a bill to put a bandage on what is essentially a bandage on what is essentially a gunshot wound uh, with the rain tax. Um, they're looking to um, reduce it by one-third um, in an effort to keep the other two-thirds of it. And, um, you know, we're here to stand up and say no. We win it all gone. Um, what's, what, how are you standing up to say no? What's taking place? Um, well, we're, um, our, we, we've been told that, um, we've been told from members of the council that the votes are there to repeal the rain tax. Okay. And so we're organizing, um, faith leaders, business owners, activists to, uh, come Tuesday to the bill hearing and, you know, let our councilmen know why this rain tax is bad, why we want to see it gone and well, how it's hurting our communities. When and where is the hearing going to take place? Uh, Tuesday, uh, February 24th at 2 p.m. at uh, 400 Washington Avenue in Towson, Maryland, at the old courthouse. Uh, that's where our county council meets. Okay. Is there a location where people can go on the web or elsewhere to get more information about this if they live in Baltimore uh, County or they live uh, in the yeah. surrounding area and just want to pose? Yeah. The you know, you don't have you don't have to live in Baltimore County to come and testify. Um, you know, we when our thing is that we wanted people to come out and want to show mass numbers. And, um, you know, we anybody that come out, you know, testify or don't, we, we appreciate the support. Um, we have a Facebook now, fan, we, a Facebook event page up. Um, it's called Kill the Baltimore, Stop the, Bar, Stop the Rain Tax in Baltimore County. Okay. And will this hearing go on rain or shine? Yes, I believe so. Absolutely. Outstanding. Outstanding. So wh now what is the current um, – What's it like in Baltimore County as far as this rain tax? How is it being implemented, or what is the current charge? How does that exist? What, what exists there? Um, it's, it's, I believe uh, it's, um, there's a set rate for residentials, um, and then there's a uh, fluctuate, you know, there's a formula for, uh, you know, a nonprofit and, uh, you know, and commercial. Okay, and if it's repealed, what what will happen? What's going to happen? Uh, go, it, our, our goal is to have it reduced to one penny. Okay. Now, there are, I think there's a misperception out in the public, or at least what the Democratic um, uh, individuals in the legislature who were pushing this tax on the citizens mm -hmm. were saying was, we have to do this because of some federal mandate, and if we don't do it, we're in trouble. But... Yet, I don't believe any other state has interpreted the so-called mandate to mean that the actions that have been put on the, the um, Marylanders have to be have to actually be taken. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Um, that's the way I interpret it, and um, that's the way uh, former Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli interpreted it when he challenged the feds on it and won. Okay, so. Do you have an idea or an understanding of why Maryland would choose to put this tremendous burden on its citizens, yet um, claim that their hands are tied and they have to do this because the federal government is mandating it? Well, one, the counties are doing it because there's a state law that mandates them to do it. Well, the second, I understand. So, yeah, well, yeah, why the would second, the state the, do that the, to its the, citizens? I mean, is it yeah. possible? that some interests such as the environmental movement in the state of Maryland might be getting an inordinate benefit from the money that's Absolutely. raised? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, who's, who's, you know, and I say this very sarcastically, best suited to implement environmental programs to help save the bay? <laughs> I, mean, okay. I mean, th this cash has to go is, somewhere. Now, my understanding is this money can be spent on education, quote-unquote, and that, therefore, large amounts of the money that are raised can actually be given to groups like the Bay Foundation and others mm -hmm. who say, oh, we're going to go out and educate people because we're going to take this money, and maybe that education means let's throw a big dinner for 
so-and-so who voted to give us the money and make sure that all their constituents know that they got this award from us for being so pro um, so pro Bay, you know, the Bay. Yeah, it was, that's, just, that's exactly how it works. Um, I can actually say this, you know, um, Baltimore County, County Executive uh, Kevin Kamenetz, um, you know, pretty much put it right out there, you know, to uh, – to, to the committee, you know, you know, repeal this rain tax, you find a way to, to fill the hole that it's going to create in the budget, you know, which tells me that, you know, this isn't an issue of saving the day. This is an issue of finding another way to raid people's pockets. You know, um, I think the biggest, um, you know, you know, people have been asking me, you know, the budget issues come up a bit. People have been asking me, you know, how do you, you know, if there's a hole in the budget, how do you deal with it? Well, I said, you know, I think Senator Jim Broshin said it best. The county has a surplus, and um, they don't need this money, and they should be trying to take it from the residents. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, is there a uh, – well, let's, well, let's step back a minute. There are other counties that have done this, such as Carroll County, correct? Yeah, Carroll, Frederick. Um, the 10 largest counties were the ones mandated to do it. Did, did, did Carroll County collapse after they put in the one penny? No, nope, neither did Frederick. So Carroll and Frederick seem to have survived, right? Oh, absolutely. Now, um, I know that the governor put in a bill, uh, both in the Senate and the House, and it's going through the speaker to try to withdraw this, and you have Mike Miller giving indications, well, that's not likely going to happen. So what I see is happening most likely um, would be that they're going to come to an agreement. If you want this, such as Montgomery County wants to tax its citizens for a rain tax, and they're all willing to say, yes, my money is going to buy, you know, plastic rain barrels that can go at the end of my <laughs> uh, gutter and, you know, can, you know, save the rainwater. I don't know how taxing somebody because the water hits the roof and then goes down to the ground makes any sense when the money that is taxed goes to buy a rain barrel to keep it permanently from going in the ground. But that's yeah. one of the things one of the things that they're doing with it, correct, is they're buying these rain barrels and saying that's uh, somehow saving the environment. Yeah, which is, which is it's no different than, uh, you know, the other quote-unquote impervious surfaces that the home has. Absolutely no different. It just, you know, delays the amount of time from when the water actually has come out. Has has this already been implemented in uh, Baltimore County, and are they collecting a revenue? Um, how much revenue are we talking about? If you know, um, I don't. I don't have the rough numbers right here in front of me. Okay. Um, but but to my understanding of that, um, I don't. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's actually physically been collected yet. Um, I think they're making okay. an attempt to pack it, to patch it up before I guess they actually get running with it. Um, but you know, they're, they, they, I think, you know, they see the writing on the wall and, um, you know, they're making an attempt to save it before it's gone completely out of their hands. But, you know, to so, put this out there, the so, votes so most likely, repeal ahead, the I'm rain sorry. tax are there. So most likely what's going to happen is in the legislature, at least if this passes through is while you keep the one penny, uh, tax on the rain tax, what's probably going to happen is that the other counties, um, you know, maybe uh, Montgomery, um, I don't know, uh, Howard or, um, you know, one of the other counties may choose to say, yes, we want to keep this in place. Um, and the other counties uh, who don't want it, if this, the governor's bill passes and if the amendments go, as I think they are, they'll be both sides will be able to claim victory because they'll say, if you don't want it, you can just get rid of it. And if you do want it and you're an ultra liberal county, then you can impose this. Um, how is it being done currently um, in Baltimore County? Do they do the nonprofits also? Are they hitting churches? They are other hitting churches in the faith community very hard. Um, actually, the Baltimore Jewish Center, um, well, not, not Jewish Center, but there's a synagogue in uh, Pikesville um, that, you know, they they have like something like a $5,500 rain tax uh, bill. You are um, kidding me. Yeah, I'm dead serious. So that's money that otherwise might have helped. Um, yeah, they, I mean, families. they have a school. I mean, they, you know, that's money that otherwise would have gone to provide students with scholarships to their school that is now going to go to uh, the county executive slush fund. 
So, yes. County Executive Trust, the uh, uh, slush fund, you call it? <laughs> did, you say, did you say slush fund? I said a slush fund. Oh, okay. Um, so let me get this right. If we allow the um, local Christian Jewish school to keep those monies, the $5,500 or so, they would be using it for altruistic purposes, helping uh, children get an education, helping mm -hmm. more families that may be part of that community to get some things that they need, um, and taking care of the needs of those who um, are members of the congregation who you know, may have a, uh, an ill um, member of the uh, family who is maybe the uh, provider, dad is sick or ill. So those monies will no longer be available to go out and help the poor no. in our community. But they will be available to give to the green organizations so that they can uh, give it to people to do uh, studies or to give awards and uh, to legislators who voted for this. Absolutely. With endorsements. Mm -hmm. um, is there is there anywhere in Maryland that the federal government has come down and said, you have to do this, and they've won a lawsuit, or they've put some mandate other than just the unjustified arguments of our elected officials that this is something that you have, we had to do, that we were mandated to do? Not that I'm aware of. So what, what, what are we looking for? Tell me again before uh, we close out here in the next couple of minutes, everything that anybody who wants to fight this, who wants to come out, who wants to support this, can do, and how they can get in touch with you or your organizations to do this, and how we can stop this. Well, uh, Mr. Right. Gray, would you do that? Uh, the first thing is um, if you aren't or not able to come out, um, the easiest thing is to uh, email and call the county members of the Baltimore County Council. Um, and we have that. We'll have that information in our Facebook event page. Um, kill the brain tax in Baltimore County. Um, the second we, thing, we, if you, tell us ahead. how to get that page again. Uh, it's a fan. It's an event page on Facebook. Um, you can either go to my page, uh, Eugene Craig, on Facebook with the Baltimore County Republican Party um, page. Is, is you can find it there also. But it's a uh, kill the brain. Kill the brain tax in Baltimore County. Um, the second thing, um, if you're free Tuesday at 2 p.m., um, please come out, you know, testify against the bill. Even if you just want to come out and just to show support, um, you know, it matters. Showing up matters, and it matters. It's really critical now. And uh, if anyone wants to reach me personally, um, I'm easily reachable on Facebook and Eugene Craig Third, or um, via email at eugene at eugenecraig.com. Well, outstanding, Eugene. And if there's anything else that we can do, um, let us know. Um, and we want to see, maybe you can come back and let us know how this goes next week if you have a couple minutes. Oh, and absolutely. Let us know how it works out. Do we know when they'll be taking a vote? Um, I believe that day. I believe, on, I believe on Tuesday. Okay, so afterwards that they'll take the vote. And all this will be done in public because yes. there's no reason to have a closed session to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, Eugene, I want to thank you very much for coming on today and uh, informing uh, the public to be out there on Tuesday at this, and they can go to your site and uh, get the information. Thank you very much. You're always uh, informative, and thanks for keeping up the fight and uh, uh, fighting against those uh, taxes that are unnecessary. Um, Appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks again. And look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully 